Listen. So this is like the hateful eight minus one. If any of y'all have seen Identity, which I highly recommend, it's kind of like that too, but with not as many twists or at least ones you don't already see coming. But pretty much the premise is that there's a bunch of strangers who find themselves at this hotel that's split between Nevada and California. And that just really means that you pay a dollar more if you want to stay in Cali. But the thing about it is that there's so many secrets at this hotel before it just becomes run down. I personally thought it was a fun rent it. It did drag a little bit at parts, but knowing that Drew Goddard worked on this and he wrote Cloverfield, which I absolutely love, Cabin in the Woods, he show ran Daredevil, and of course to the greatest show of all time, as confirmed by the gods, Lost, I obviously understood why the cast took pay cuts to make this movie so it was able to be as wild as it is. Let me explain. So the first shot we get in this hotel is your boy Ron Swanson hiding money in the floorboards before he gets offed. Oh man. Years later, we meet these other characters who may be hiding more than Nick was in the floorboards. There's Flynn who's pretending to be a priest when he's actually a thief, and Offerman's brother, and they were actually supposed to meet at the Royale after the heist in order to get the money, but the dude got locked up. Years later, when he's finally out, he's got dementia, so it causes him to book the wrong room so he can't even get it. So meanwhile, in room 5, you have a soul singer named Darlene Sweet, who travels with these mattresses in order to make her room soundproof for her vocal exercises. Looking like us when we record LMEs on the road. But her backstory is that there's never been a man who's treated her well, right? Hell, even Xavier Dolan appears in this movie for a bit, trying to CK her. And probably why he was also too busy to finish editing his last movie. Her and the priest have a nice lunch together. And like most of these type of meetings, he tries to sedate her to get into the room. She gives him head, only to have to deal with this guy. Damn, boy, where you been? Waiting in this lobby so long, I could use a shave. Now, John's the third guy who we meet in this movie, but he was actually the first one there. And as much as he wants to pretend that he's a madman over appliances that he's trying to sell, in reality, this dude's working for the CIA. Specifically, he's there in a room checking the wiretaps that they've left behind in the hotel that are all in the appliances that he's selling, only to realize that somebody else is wiretapping his wiretaps, so he snaps the wires. My man then finds this secret tunnel that lets you look into each person's room from the other side of their mirrors, audio and all, with a camera even stationed in one of the rooms to film them in private. And somehow things still get Fifty Shades Darker. In room 7, there's this chick named Emily who has the worst style of anyone in this movie, who pulls up with a body she's hiding in her room. Laramie Seymour Sullivan goes in there after screwing with everyone's car so they can't leave, and instead of living long enough to become the villain, dude dies a hero as he realizes that Emily's actually holding her own sister hostage since she got brainwashed by this dude. I mean... I mean, I can see it. Turns out Shane should have done a 27-part docuseries on this little sister since she accidentally sliced her parents to death with a knife. They then, of course, had to run away as sisters and accidentally joined a cult that's run by Chris Hemsworth playing a hot Charles Manson during that time. And he allows the girls to do group catfights with each other, you know, to get a chance to sleep with him. Oh, Chris. So even though Emily was able to kidnap her own sister and hide her out at the El Royale, this Dora the Exterminator makes a quick call to Billy D for him to show up. So now you got a priest thief and a singer who've agreed to work together to find the money, a dead John Hamm, two sisters on the run from the police and a call, a poor little Esteban running this hotel by himself, and then Thor decides to come in and lay down his hammer. Deer Hunter hasn't even come out, yet he starts killing them Russian Roulette style when he finds this tape. Now for those of y'all who have an issue with the golden briefcase from Pulp Fiction because they don't really answer what's in the golden briefcase from Pulp Fiction, you ain't gonna like this one either. They purposely never answer who's on the tape because they wanted to focus on a speech from Darlene on how it's clearly just some white rich dude, probably a politician who talks a lot that'll never get in trouble even though there's evidence of him getting caught on tape. But besides the very strong illusion they're trying to make, my friend Amanda actually had a pretty good video breakdown on all the possibilities of who it could have been. But I personally still think it's JFK, right? One, he would have been famous enough for even this crazy sister to recognize and he would have had a very famous death. The El Royale is actually based off of a real location that has its many conspiracies, one of which is that it had these secret tunnels where he was able to go and do things with people like Marilyn Monroe, who was actually in one of the pictures at the El Royale along with the Rat Pack and everybody else, implying that she would have been there. And we all know the stories of this dude right here and how he was practically the political Will Chamberlain. They don't ever Hannah Baker the tape and release it, but that's mainly because everyone at the hotel dies because of the fire, except these two who make it out to Reno, where Larry, 
Jerry, Gary, another Parks and Rec character introduces her and they show how both of these are the only ones who are able to move on from their past. However, for me, the real heart of the movie revolves around the character of Miles, the janitor slash bellhop slash Mr. Mosby of this place, who used to be a nom and killed 123 people. He's had to rely on heroin in order to not just forget the war, but all of the terrible things he's seen at the hotel, like this freaking Game of Thrones bestiality moment where a dude did it with a dead wolf. I know, I know. Heroin wasn't going to do the trick, which is why when he sees the priest, even after finding out that he's not even a real priest, he still seeks forgiveness and the dude pretends to be one on his deathbed as they God's not dead him, showing us all that sometimes it's a lie that can help another character move on. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I appreciate it. I'm very curious to know your guys' thoughts. I honestly thought this was a Coen Brothers film like for months until I, <laughs> I literally until I saw the credits the, the title ones open up and I'm like oh snap this is a Drew Goddard film I had no idea I had only seen the posters and never really saw any of the trailers but I think it's interesting it does sadly drag on at parts uh it literally is like a it's told like Pulp Fiction it, it's hateful late but at a you know more contemporary hotel but it's still a good movie i'm curious to know your thoughts on it your, your theories who you think was on the tape uh, there's also another i want to say a fun rumor that the guy uh miles was actually caught in vietnam so technically all of the second wiretaps are from like the foreign country who's making him do all these things i think it's kind of interesting but i'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section i still think it's worth watching more so at home but uh definitely let me know your thoughts don't forget to comment like and subscribe and i won't release your tape